Welcome to Upticks, I'm Jake Falcon. And I'm Corey Bittner. We're the founders of Falcon Wealth Advisors and your co-host for Upticks. Today is our 39th episode, Bon Voyage. We're talking about travel tips, bonds, and March Madness. Okay, Corey. It's our building manager out there. We're uh, filming today from our uh, beautiful view atop of the 1900 building in Mission Woods, Kansas, because we're getting furniture delivered. That's right. (laughs) So uh, we're doing this outside, so hopefully the audio uh, sounds great for our listeners and our viewers. I recently went on a vacation with my wife, Rachel, and I wanted to talk for our planning portion today about some travel tips as far as uh, dealing with the financial budget and um, going on vacation. Perfect. Well, first, though, before you get into that, where did you go and did you enjoy it? Uh, I went to Mexico with Rachel. and Actually, it was her idea, and uh, I'd say we had a great time. Good. Uh, I was actually probably looking forward to getting back to work more than she was. Uh, A little fun fact is she read six books on our vacation. In how many days? Probably, I think it was around five-ish. Wow. So, uh, special uh, props to my wife for uh, being the reader that she is. Pretty uh, remarkable that she read six. I haven't read that many this year. Neither have I. And she read uh, six on our vacation. But I did want to share with our viewers um, some things that I did as far as working through our budget uh, before we left. And so we worked with a travel agent. I think that made it a lot easier uh, for both of us. We're both uh, busy professionals. And, you know, I didn't want to look online for flights and transportation and hotels and yada, yada, yada. And so uh, I think my trip, my tip number one is to... Uh, Go ahead and listen to a travel agent. They certainly can help save you some money and make that trip that much more enjoyable. I'll give you an example of something that happened. We were down there and we had a spa day planned and when we showed up to the spa, uh, for some reason the spa had lost our reservation. Mm. And so rather than Rachel and I having to scramble and figure things out, I simply messaged our travel agent and magically uh, they seemed to get things figured out and took care of us. And so it was just nice having that third party uh, in the States um, there to help lean on in case I needed needed help with something. So again, uh, tip number one is it pays to go ahead and work with a travel agent. I met this person. Uh, they did a phenomenal job. Uh, I met them actually through a client of mine, referred them to me, and uh, I probably definitely would use them again. They did a really good job. If you don't mind me asking, how do I'm working with a travel agent uh, for our for Cassie and I for our honeymoon, um, and I think it differs for everybody. But if you don't mind me asking, how does the agent that you worked with how do they get paid? That's a great question. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't write them a check. Uh, sure. You know, they sold me some insurance, some travel insurance, so yeah. maybe they got something off of that. I'm assuming the resorts uh, probably give them a little kickback. I don't know if they get paid on airfare anymore. But um, so again, I didn't write a check directly to the but travel it's not agent. Not right fee that you paid yeah. them for their. Service. Right, right. So it's kind of like a real estate agent. You yeah, know, they they do sense. get paid. Um, you know, but again, for if, if you're busy uh, or you're certainly going somewhere maybe you've never been before and you wanted some advice. Yeah. I think uh, using a travel agent, and you know, you know, I, I go on trips uh, to make memories. Uh, that's certainly what my wife has taught me, and she's really big into that. So, if I want to have a memorable experience, why not use a travel agent? Somebody that's going to know the lay of the land a little bit better than I might. Makes sense. What is tip number two? Tip number two is I think it's worth spending money on things that you value. Uh, for example, we spent a little bit more money to have a room with an ocean view, mm. and that was definitely worth it for us. We weren't staring at another building. Um, or, you know, the parking lot or whatever. We had a gorgeous view. Uh, We had a a soaking tub on our balcony. Nice. And we literally were steps from the ocean. What exactly is a soaking tub? I didn't get in it. Rachel did. (laughs) But it's like a little hot tub. Okay. It's a little hot tub. The water felt warm. I think I put my hand in it. But um, somewhere just to chill out on their balcony and enjoy the nice weather. So, so again, we spent uh, some money on that because... Um, we did want to spend some time in the room just to relax, and to us that was worth it. So, you know, a lot of pl- people will say, you know, it doesn't matter. You're just going to sleep there and shower there or yeah. whatever or use a, use a bathroom and a bed. But, you know, I like having a nice room. There's something to be said about that. And when I checked into the hotel, I certainly asked, actually, if they had any upgrades available. And they, they told me, you're staying in one of the nicest rooms we have. So my travel agent made sure that was set up. I made sure when I got to the, to the resort that it was set up. And um, it was wor- well worth it. So, again, I, I think you need to be careful about what you value and what you don't value. And it's okay to spend a little bit more money on the room if, you're, if you know you're going to spend some time there. Can you give an example of something that you don't see as much value in? Probably the transportation service that we use. Now, we didn't use a cab 
we were flew into Cancun, but we um, we had a travel service and they were fine. But there was tons of them to choose from, so I'm yeah. not, I'm assuming that my travel agent probably picked one that was budget friendly. Uh, something like that. It's just a means to an but end. But it didn't make a difference to you. Right, right. Maybe on some of our meals too. We didn't um, we didn't spend a lot of money on some of our meals. Yeah. Maybe we had a, you know a few nice ones, but sure. uh, but things like that. You know, we didn't we didn't get caught up in the typical touristy stuff either. I wasn't buying like magnets for you and Cassie to bring home or yeah, I know. You know what I mean? Or I bottles of tequila <laughs> or anything like. You know, I wasn't getting caught up in that. Yeah. I you get know, it, I yeah. spent a lot of money on the room. I had a good a few good meals, and that's really what it was about. And that actually leads me to my third tip was that, um, you know, it's a good idea to have a budget in mind before the trip. And especially if you're working with a travel agent, I was very clear with my travel agent what I wanted to spend. Yes. Um, and then they, that way they could fall within that budget. And then we tweak things from there. So it's okay to, to have a five or $10,000 budget for your trip um, and then work from there. So again, we saved some money uh, on, on, on the package or whatever that we chose so we did um, splurge a little bit on some nice meals on the resort. But it ended up falling right in line with your expectations. Exactly. So I wasn't surprised when I had a big bill when I left the hotel because I, it was all in the budget. It was all in the overall budget. One thing I did want to say on that also is that you know a lot of people will do these all-inclusives when they go to Mexico, and I'm, I'm sure those are fine uh, for the right type of crowd. Um, you know, But for us, uh, we did not do an all-inclusive, and it was actually nice because we avoided the spring breakers and people that maybe were going to take advantage of that to overindulge. Uh, so our resort was very yeah. family friendly. Uh, it wasn't going crazy. People weren't uh, acting out of order. Um, you know, it was a very adult, sophisticated environment. And that's something that Rachel and I enjoyed. We weren't looking to drink as much tequila as possibly, possibly yeah. could, right? Or, or, get, or stuff as many tacos down our bellies as we could. We wanted to have some good quality meals. You know, if Rachel wanted to have a cocktail or whatever, um, but again, so again, I don't think an all-inclusive necessarily makes sense for everybody. Sure. Those are my three tips. So again, good stuff. Work, 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 it pays to work with a travel agent, in my opinion. Um, you know, spend things. It's okay to spend some money on some things that you're going to value on the trip. Um, and then again, set an overall budget, and that way uh, that you're not surprised. And, and if you got a budget in mind, and you're, you're working with a competent travel agent that can help fall in that place, it all worked out. And like I said, we had a really, really nice time. Good. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And uh, so switching gears for our next topic, we, uh, you wanted to talk about bonds. Uh, maybe give us a di big 10,000 foot view of what a bond is. And then maybe talk a little bit about with our viewers what we're doing for our clients as far as managing their bond portfolios today. Sure. So to get us kicked off, let's talk about what a bond is. At its highest level, you can think of a bond as purchasing debt from an, an, an entity or a creditor. For instance, the most common places that someone will purchase a bond from, like me as an investor, I could buy a bond from uh, the United States government, I could buy a bond from a municipality in the state of Missouri or Kansas or wherever in the country, or I could buy a bond from a corporation. So I'm going to use the third one as an example just to kind of drive the point home. The idea is think of a company like Verizon. I'm going to use this as an example. Verizon might issue a bond or issue debt. The reason they're doing that is because they want to raise capital for you know whatever they want they to. They want spend. to build towers, or they whatever want to spend they want money to, on or whatever. Buy they, towers or whatever. Whatever, right? They just they need an influx of capital. So but the, they don't want to sell stock, so they're not looking for ownership. Yes. They want a loan. They want a loan. So what they're doing is, if I buy Verizon's bonds, let's say it matures in five years and it's going to pay me a four and a half percent interest rate over the next five years. The idea is, I am purchasing their debt, so I'm lo I'm loaning them money and they're going to pay me a fixed predetermined interest rate from when I buy that bond until the maturity date. And you know, as long as Verizon stays solvent, that is, uh, you know, it's a good, it's a, it's a bond for me to own that I can generate some income from. Uh, so it's gonna do more than just if the money was sitting in cash, but it's not like taking the level of risk that I would take if I went and bought Verizon stock, for instance. So why wouldn't people just buy all bonds? That's a great question. And it's one that comes up all the time. Usually when the market's very volatile, uh, the reason that somebody doesn't want to buy all bonds is because they will not provide the type of growth that stocks will over the long term. And that's really the that's the. I get it. Reason. Yeah. So so if you have a portfolio, and your financial plan says you need to make seven percent for your retirement goals to play out, you can't put all of your money in Verizon bonds because you're only going to make in this example four and a half percent. Right. So you need. It sounds like you need a little bit of both. So the bonds will dampen that volatility when the stock market's going crazy, but when things are growing and you're needing some growth, they're not gonna maybe do that as effectively as owning a stock mine. 
Right, exactly. And if you know, if our viewers have seen before, there's the Kalan chart that we talk about, mm -hmm. uh, and it shows all of the different colored boxes on it. And you know, some people, observers, just from a high level, will notice that if each row is a year, and it goes from the beginning of 2000 through the end of 2018, and each different box on that chart reflects a different asset class or sector of the market, the idea is bonds tend to hang out toward the bottom, not because they're bad performing investments, it's simply because they don't grow the same way that stocks do. Makes sense. So what I think is an interesting observation is if you go and look at the years where there was a lot of panic, for instance, uh, 2000, 2001, 2002, when the dot-com bubble burst, uh, 2008, when the housing bubble burst, you can see in those years, bonds rise up toward the top because they tend to hold up much better. Uh, and in fact, people sell stocks when they're scared and they put their money in bonds and bonds can actually increase in value when that happens. So here lately, the yield curve has flattened and right. or it's actually inverted a little bit. So what are we having uh, or asking Jesse, our investment analyst, to do with our clients' bond portfolios right now? Right now, we are actively managing bonds for our clients, and what we've asked Jesse to do is go through and audit the fixed income or bond positions that our clients own. And the reason we've asked him to do that is to identify any opportunities, one, where perhaps the bonds have appreciated in value, whereas if we hold them until their maturity, we're gonna actually lose that appreciation if we would only get our principal back. So locking in any gains, if we can turn around and reinvest the proceeds into something paying a comparable level of interest, if not better, uh, and secondly, you know, just assessing the level of risk as well, because the idea is with bonds, you know, there can be companies. Well, let me give you an example, uh, and it's not to pick on them, but we know that over the last couple of years, GE is uh, General Electric has had some of its mm -hmm. issues, uh, and historically, people saw GE as as solid of the companies you could possibly invest in, uh, and it's still a very solid company as far as I'm concerned. But the idea is, you know, things can fluctuate in price, and if you're lending money to an entity for a fixed interest rate. You want to make sure that that entity is going to stay solvent, right. and you're going to get your principal back at maturity. Right. Good. Good. So that's what we're doing right now. So we're so Jesse's auditing our bonds with our clients, making sure that they've got good quality. If we can capture any gains, we're certainly going to do that if it makes sense for the client. And because we don't charge commissions to trade bonds, we're really only doing it because it's in our client's best interest. Exactly, and that's the last point that I wanted to make, and I'm glad you said that because we don't. While we will ladder bonds, we'll buy bonds that are maturing in different years, uh, the idea is some of those bonds we're going to hold until maturity, but if there's opportunities for us to make money for our clients, it would be foolish for us to not take advantage of those. Right. But since we're not brokers, right, or we're not acting in a brokerage capacity on those bonds, it doesn't cost, there's no commission that, you know, Mr. Smith is paying Jake and Corey if we buy one bond and sell another. So I know a lot of the times brokers will use well, you know, if you're just going to buy a bond, you're going to hold it until maturity. They'll use that as a reasoning for not making any trades, but they can get paid a big commission when they buy it. They right. can get paid a big commission when they sell it. Right. So you have to be careful with that. If your advisor is telling you there's no fee on the bonds, that means they're typically charging you a commission and they're going to hold that bond to maturity, which is fine unless they're foregoing an opportunity to make you more money. Exactly. And so, again, we don't like that. We don't want to be transactional. Uh, in our behavior with our clients. We want to be more as an advisory standpoint. And again, that's the, why we do the business the way that we do for our clients. Yeah, exactly. And you know, hopefully our viewers, that I think they're probably, if they're smart enough or have the curiosity to want to watch this, hopefully they can understand that no one's buying and selling bonds for them for free. So if somebody tells right. you that, you just need to question it because it's yep. frankly probably not true. Right, right. I guess so to our fun topic today, I wanted to talk about March Madness and your bracket. Ah, me too. I'm excited <laughs> to talk about this after last week, so I'm going to actually pull it up right here. Go ahead. Well, I know um, that you had Yale going into the Sweet 16, right? and that's not going to happen. <laughs> so I'm just curious, uh, what teams what teams are in your Final Four? And I know you've climbed the rankings on our client bracket. I have. Um, and so I'm just curious, but I'm not going to take you to lunch if you win, yeah, so fair enough. But I, uh, I wouldn't expect you to. But who uh, who do you have in your final four? We'll see uh, if, it, if it's going to play out. So the the two brackets that I have, one is internally, right, amongst our team, and then one is with our clients. Let's talk about our client one. In our and it's different in each one. But in our client bracket, which is the one I wanted to talk about today, also the teams that I have in the final four are Duke, Tennessee, Gonzaga, and North Carolina. Why'd you pick Tennessee? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I think. <laughs> uh, Again, it's so a lot of this was very not even educated guesses. It was just purely guesses. Um, I think that well, time will tell. But in going through filling out the bracket, and I didn't have a ton of knowledge about this stuff to begin with. 
I had the recency bias that Virginia lost last year to a 16 seed. Mm. So in both of the brackets that I filled out, and neither of them did I have Virginia making the Final Four. And I think have they lost? No, they're okay. still they're still out there. But in one, I had Tennessee, and the other Purdue. But did you see that Central Florida Duke game? I did not. Wow, I heard about it. Wow, that was probably the the most exciting game that I watched this year. Uh, my brackets are busted, but uh, certainly it's a great time of year in Kansas City. Uh, you know, we're filming this outside. I'm a little cold. It's a little chilly. <laughs> but, if you uh, see me rubbing my hands, that's why. But spring is here. Uh, March Madness is most certainly here. And thank you all, as always, for tuning in. Uh, certainly you can find us out all on our social media platforms. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, please subscribe and share our content here on YouTube. And you can find me personally on Twitter at Jake Falcon CRPC. And you can find me on Twitter at Corey Bittner KC. Thanks again for watching, and we hope you all have a great week.